Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gregory Frollo. I'm a vice president of the Free Russia Foundation. I'm welcoming you for our today double presentation of first, uh, the third volume of uh, the Kremlin Influence Quarterly, our quarterly journal on uh, uh, Russian influence in European Union, countries of Eastern Partnership and Western Balkans. And secondly, today we also have a presentation of a special uh, issue of the of the journal uh, on disinformation, Euroscepticism, and pro-Russian parties in Eastern Europe by Maria Snigovaya. Uh, I am welcoming uh, our today's panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, Grigory uh, uh, Mesezhnikov, uh, who is a political scientist and uh, president of Institute of Public Affairs in Slovakia. Uh, I'm welcoming uh, Razvan Avido uh, Siluka, who is a PhD candidate in international relations at the Department of International Studies and Contemporary History of the uh, Babish Ballet University of Cluj-Napoca in Romania. He is an expert and specializing in uh, analyzing and countering hybrid threats for Intel for Patreon. Uh, I'm welcoming Maria uh, Snigavaya. She is a uh, postdoctoral fellow at the Kellogg Center for Philosophy, Politics, and Economic uh, at the Virginia Tech, as well as a visiting scholar at the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the George Washington University. And of course, uh, Anton Shekhovtsov is joining us. He is a senior fellow with the Free Russia Foundation and uh, editor-in-chief uh, of uh, uh, our journal. Um, I'm not going to steal the floor for too long. Uh, we actually uh, have been delaying the launch of this journal for the third issue of the journal for a couple of months, but I believe the third issue uh, is actually even better than two previous. We, in this issue, we're covering uh, uh, Russian malign operations in Czech Republic, in France, uh, in Romania, in Slovakia, uh, in Germany, as well as in Georgia. Uh, Actually, uh, the journal is now available on our website, as well as a, a special issue by Maria Snigavaya. So right after uh, our presentation, uh, I'm inviting everyone to download it uh, and read carefully. Uh, the audience, everyone is able to uh, ask uh, any questions related to our topic uh, in the comments below this. Uh, uh, live webcast, uh, so don't hesitate to uh, enjoy communication with our today's guests. So, Anton, please, uh, the floor is yours, uh, and good luck to everyone. Thank you very much, Greg, and uh, happy to see all of you uh, today. I will present, I will do my own presentation first. Uh, about my own contribution to, to this edition, and then I will moderate the uh, discussion. So my contribution, I think it was a bit, um, I'd say it was probably a bit surprising because I was essentially focusing uh, not on a particular country, but on a particular uh, development. Uh, usually in the, in the Kremlin's influence quarter, we focus on only one country, sometimes even on one particular area. Uh, in, in this country, where can we, where we can identify Russian malign influence? But this time, I was looking at a, at a very interesting development, in my opinion. Uh, you may have heard that in autumn um, last year, uh, a, a French teacher was killed uh, brutally uh, by by Islamist terrorist in in a region around Paris, and. Uh, the, the police shot uh, the, 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 the terrorist, and he turned out to be a, uh, a Chechen refugee, so a Russian refugee of Chechen origin. Actually, he was not born in, in Chechnya. He was born in Moscow, as far as I understand. And, he, and then he uh, traveled with his parents when he was still very young uh, to France, uh, where they received uh, this uh, status of, of, of refugees. And... Um, the majority, the overwhelming majority of uh, of, of Muslim communities, uh, of Chechen communities in France and also uh, Europe, they unequivocally condemned this terrorist attack and this this brutal murder of uh, French teacher. And he was 
he was killed essentially because he was uh, teaching his pupils uh, because of freedom of speech, of freedom of expression, the Republican values. Uh, some uh, some uh, parents complained that he apparently showed uh, some caricatures uh, on uh, on the the founder of Islam, Muhammad. Uh, although he was actually very sensitive uh, about those issues and he would even ask those who would be offended by those caricatures or some depictions of the founder of Islam, uh, pupils could leave the, the room for, for that time. But anyway, uh, there was this huge campaign against this teacher on the internet and uh, this Islamist uh, terrorist, uh, Abdullah Abz uh, Anzorov, he found out about this campaign and he decided to kill uh, this teacher. So, as I, as I said, uh, there was condemnation. And if you look also at the, at the reactions of the official Kremlin, they also were totally condemning. So, there was no ambiguity about condemning this attack. And as well, I was focusing on Ramzan Kadyrov, the, the leader of Chechnya, that was very interesting because at first he also condemned the attack and he actually tried to disown Abdullah Hanzorov. He would say, well, he is not a real Chechen. He lived most of his life in, uh, in France. He would speak French. He would communicate with his friends in, in French. So he's not real Chechen. But then something changed and essentially what Kadyrov started was an attack on Macron and uh, verging on just justifying this attack and justifying this Islamist terrorism uh, operation. What happened? And here's I, I want to just step back a little bit and um, tell uh, and talk to you about the the general picture of the relations between Russia and France. Um, Obviously, and you may know that uh, in the French presidential elections of 2017, Moscow supported uh, the leader of the uh, far-right party, uh, Marine Le Pen. However, uh, and also uh, Macron was a bit skeptical about Russia, and uh, especially he didn't like RT and Sputnik. Uh, however, with time, Macron sort of shifted a little bit to this realpolitik approach. To Moscow. Uh, he started saying that we cannot actually solve many uh, regional and uh, global issues without Russia. We need, although we do have our differences, we still need to talk to Russia. We need to have a dialogue. And Moscow uh, totally uh, was very happy uh, about this realpolitik approach of Macron's. However, after the poisoning of the major Russian opposition uh, figure, Alexei Navalny, France, together with Germany, they adopted a very, well, I would say, even, you know, a very harsh position towards Moscow. They, uh, the, the leadership, uh, and especially also, you know, foreign ministers of, uh, of Germany and France, they started pushing uh, Russia to, you know, to do something about the poisoning and, you know, these, uh, also the use of the chemical weapons because Navichok, uh, the, the, the substance that we used to, uh, to, to try to kill uh, Navalny, uh, it is considered to be a chemical weapon. And uh, Russia, among many, many other countries, uh, uh, banned or signed the, signed the agreement to ban the use and production of chemical weapons. So it was a clear violation. And, and France and, and Germany, they were very strict, and also the United States, obviously. And even the sanctions were also introduced uh, in autumn, um, and those sanctions were pushed by Germany and France in the European Union. We're talking about the European Union. So there was this conflict, and, and Moscow didn't like it. So Kadyrov changed his position, and this is where what we don't know, whether he was asked by the Kremlin uh, to, to change the position, or he himself understood that, well, this is, this is his chance. So, um, Kadyrov shifted from saying, 
Well, we definitely condemn the terrorist attack. However, we would like to ask the authorities of France not to provoke, you know, the, the, the Muslim believers uh, so they don't do this. And he shifted his position from this sort of moderate uh, condemnation to uh, almost any absence of, of condemnation saying, well, ter uh, Macron is a terrorist number one. Not not Anzorov, not uh, not anyone else, but Macron was the terrorist number one in France and and you know and, and in Europe, and he was joined by the religious leadership of Chechnya. He was joined by um, various celebrities, including MMA fighters uh, of Chechen origin, and not only Chechen origin. So there was this change. And I was trying to understand why the change, and uh, I came. Uh, I came to. Uh, uh, I would like to present you my several of my uh, observations why it happened. So on the one hand, or the first, the first reason why Kadyrov started promoting this narrative is because that was essentially for him a uh, continuation of his own fight against Western secularism and liberalism. He, for example, after, uh, after the, uh, this horrible, uh, totally horrible Islamist terror attack on uh, French satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo, uh, where we, we, we saw 12 people killed uh, in this attack, he, Kadyrov, organized the demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of people in Chechnya demonstrating against Sir Charlie Hebdo. So Kadyrov has this history of, uh, of, of his fight you know, against, his, against secularism and republican values. Second, uh, he strives, uh, Kadyrov strives to be uh, recognized as the major defender of Islam. Um, and because uh, there was Another, there was a different context also to the, to the reactions to uh, the murder of Samuel Paty that Turkey and Iran also attacked uh, Macron, and Kadyrov, uh, from this perspective, did not want to, uh, you know, uh, to be missing from from this fight, and he joined essentially uh, Turkey and Iran in in uh, attacking Macron. Third, um, Kadyrov. Uh, by his, uh, at some point, it was almost glorification of uh, of Anzorov and his attack, because in in this understanding, this Islamist understanding, uh, Anzorov, the killer, he stood up for Islam, and by glorifying him, uh, Kadyrov also probably wanted to allow some Chechen Islamists to, uh, so to say, to let off steam. And they could express their radical sentiments uh, joining Kadyrov, but that would be uh, expression, the expression of radical sentiments in a very controlled environment created by the Chechen leadership to contain Islamism. So it could be also this uh, explanation. And finally, I believe that uh, there was also this idea of ownership of the Chechen people, because uh, Kadyrov is not only the leader of Chechnya, he presents himself as the leader and sort of father figure for all the Chechens wherever they lived. So he he changed his position because at first, as I said, he tried to disown uh, Anzorov, saying, "Well, he's not a Chechen." But then he himself, Kadyrov, allowed uh, Anzorov to be buried in Chechnya, although he was, you know, he probably visited Chechnya a couple of times, but he never lived there. But that was. Uh, a move to show that Kadyrov was re-owning this Islamist terrorist. And the idea behind this ownership or re-ownership of Anzorov was that uh, whatever you do, it's like, you know, talking to Chechens, whatever you do, whatever crime you commit, you will always have our support. We will support you, no matter how serious your crime is. On the other hand, we own you, so you should behave and never try to undermine Kadyrov's authority wherever you live, either in Chechnya or in some other parts of Russia 
or in Europe or else anywhere. So this is sort of a double message. We own you, we support you. And why, for example, and when I said that Kabirov aspires to be a leader of, a leader of Muslims, uh, why, however, uh, he never criticized, for example, China for the genocide of the Uyghur Muslim minority in China. Because obviously, he would never be allowed to do this by the Kremlin. However, the Kremlin definitely allowed Kadyrov in his attack against Macron. And here are two reasons uh, why I think it happened. So one explanation is that um, it was a double game uh, on the part of Moscow. On the one hand, they welcomed the or embraced this realpolitik turn of, of President Macron's. However, it was absolutely dissatisfied with the role that France played in uh, introducing sanctions related to the poisoning of Navalny against uh, against Moscow. So that was dissatisfaction, and this is why uh, Kadyrov was allowed to do what he did. And second, I think, um, and Ivan Preobrazhensky, our colleague who also contributed to this third issue of the Kremlin's Influence Quarterly, uh, he, I think, very insightfully noted that uh, Obviously, there were attacks on, against Macron on the part of uh, Turkish President uh, Recep Erdogan, uh, the, and the Kremlin wanted to also amplify somehow uh, Kadyrov's leadership in, in the Islamic world because uh, for Moscow, the although they may be. Uh, Russia and Turkey may be uh, allies in some areas. However, Turkey is also um, competing, is also competing with Moscow um, in the region and also in the sphere of influence on the Islamic world. So by empowering Kadyrov to do what he did, it was also done in order to uh, somehow, um, you know, to compete uh, efficiently and effectively with Erdogan's Turkey. So um, this is my; th these are my observations about these uh, well influence operations. I would say uh, against against Macron, against France, against these republican values on the part of, um, of Russia, uh, and um, using Kadyrov as sort of this instrument of the of the political warfare with France. So um, I would now ask um, Razvan to talk about his research, uh, which was very interesting because we you know, we usually hear obviously about RT, uh, we uh, hear uh, a lot about you know, German edition of RT, uh, French, UK, American. However, uh, there is little and I'd say that this is probably wrong, we, we see too little uh, research done on Sputnik, and especially the, the the Romanian edition of Sputnik, and also the well the Romanian landscape media landscape is for us for many of us is um, is like terra incognita. Um, so Razvan, the floor is yours. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, Just a second to share a screen a little bit. Okay. There we are. Uh, is it everything okay? Okay, good. Uh, well, thank you for the observation, Anton, and thank you for the opportunity, uh, as well as for the introduction you, you've made to my, uh, to my contribution. Uh, basically, uh, my research focuses on the Kremlin's malign influence through uh, Sputnik Romania, Moldova. Uh, and I have, uh, I have selected the uh, 2016-2020 as a period of research, mostly because, as Anton said, uh, when it comes to uh, the Romanian case study and the Romanian media, the Romanian propagandistic media landscape, very few research or even none research is done. So for this reason, I have tried to uh, make, to realize the content analyzed is on Sputnik Romania Moldova, where I have collected uh, 24 relevant articles. Uh, if you ask me, there are even hundreds of articles, but I have to select the most relevant ones uh, for my research, because there are many articles I could have done three pieces, I think, but 
well, you know, I have, uh, I was constrained by the space, uh, but also I tried to interpret those data and I found out that five main narrative approaches are used to exert the malign influence in all, in all of its three forms, which I will cover in the following section, uh, using strategic narratives. So basically there are five main categories of strategic narratives, uh, which are correlated with the concept of, uh, with the concept of malign influence. Now, a short background uh, related to Romania. Uh, since 1997, when the US-Romania strategic partnership was signed, uh, Romania tried to secure itself uh, against emerging, emerging, emerging threats, just like the Russian Federation. Uh, but also US tried to expand its influence by offering benefits and protect its military assets in the region, which I'll cover also uh, in the following session, because there are a few military assets who uh, were targeted by the Russian propaganda and are still targeted by the Russian propaganda, actually. Uh, but in 2004, after harsh years of uh, trials of integration and uh, harsh reforms, Romania finally joined NATO. But for this reason, uh, Romania, basically this was a twofold effect. Romania secured itself against emerging threats, as I've said, as I mentioned before. But on the other hand, uh, as the NATO expanding, uh, this thing created, uh, let's say, not a good backlash uh, among Russian policymakers. And for this reason, since uh, since that moment, basically uh, a more, let's say, accurate, uh, a more accurate uh, malign influence was exerted after 2014. But since that moment, Russia wasn't really keen on uh, recognizing the new state of war where the ex-Soviet uh, or even ex-communist state joined NATO. For this reason, uh, as Anton already did uh, in the last volumes of the Kremlin's influence quarterly, uh, the Russia's malign influence is exerted in three main forms, and they are also applied to the Romanian case study. Shah power, mimetic power, and dark power. Uh, related to Romania, uh, the Shah power component tries to undermine NATO's role in Romania, to seed fractures between NATO and the European Union, and also shape Romanian public's, atti Romanian public's attitude using links or so-called links between local organized crime and the presence of natural bases in Romania. And I will cover this aspect uh, at the final of my presentation because it's a very interesting one. And I think that the international audience uh, really needs to, uh, to have a clear perception about it. Uh, also, mimetic power is present here in the form of advancing the Kremlin's belligerent perspective about NATO and also, on the other hand, expressing Moscow's friendly intention in relation to Bucharest, just like it it does in relation to other states. Dark power, the final component, which was basically conceptualized by Galeotti, but still it's very poorly conceptualized in the literature, uh, with, as, I, as, I have, as I have found out in my years of research, uh, aims to bully the alliance through anti nato narratives, policymaker and cultural actors, and this is also a very, very interesting aspect which I'll cover in the following section. The first section, the Kremlin undermining NATO's rule in Romania, usually tries to, uh, let's say, cover up a few narratives related to the NATO's negative role in the world. For instance, we, we see that NATO is labeled as nothing but a relic of the past. Uh, it, it, it's also labeled as a huge lie and danger to the whole world. Uh, Romania is thought and even uh, told to be uh, a mistake, and because Romania, because NATO entered in Romania and not Romania in NATO. So basically, they are trying to convince the public opinion in Romania that uh, NATO somehow invaded us uh, without our consent. Also, the Romanian people are used as Guinea pigs in America's attempt or America's operation to annihilate the so called strong army of Russian Federation. Uh, Romania is considered a CIA branch in the Balkans, and many more narratives. Here is the list of only the relevant, the most relevant ones which I have selected because uh, this section basically covers up uh, common narratives which are used against, let's say, other states uh, which are NATO or EU members. The second section, uh, bullying the alliance to anti-NATO narratives, policymaker and cultural, act cultural actors, also has a two-fold component. Uh, on one hand, uh, Sputnik Romania Moldova tries to bully local pro-NATO policymakers like uh, Mircea Jana, who was a very, let's say, good policymaker and who is now uh, the deputy secretary general of NATO and is labeled a fool of NATO who destroyed the Social Democratic Party who, uh, as a remark here, had also 
in the past, uh, with certain occasions, uh, a pro-Russian rhetoric, but a very, very vague one. Uh, and that, for this reason, it's considered to be the only party able to have a word in, in the face of Western orders. Uh, also about Adrian Zuckerman, uh, who is former U.S. ambassador in Romania and is the, the up until now is the first uh, Romanian American ambassador, uh, in, U.S. ambassador in Romania. Uh, he's criticized for uh, he also for certain statements in the, made in the past. Uh, related to uh, the role that Romania actually plays as a NATO member. And his, his critics usually consist in, uh, or the critics brought to him consist in the fact that the strategic partnership uh, only consisted in payments to that, uh, payments to it or deaths of Romanian soldiers, external adversities, and so on and so on. On the other hand, uh, however, uh, there are certain actors who are promoted. For instance, the former PM Adrian Nastase, who also owns a foundation in Bucharest, uh, which actually in 2013, I think, invited Jugin there, uh, had the courage to accuse NATO of violating its commitments not to expand, not to expand an inch towards East. Uh, and for this reason, he's very promoted on Sputnik and not in a single article, I mean. And also Dan Puric, who is an actor known for his nationalist view, stated that Romania's accession to NATO and the EU would have been made, would have been made without us negotiating. Uh, therefore, we have nothing to gain from this. Uh, the next section, uh, I mean, the next narrative approach, which aims to seed factions between NATO and the European Union, uh, usually targets uh, Emmanuel Macron's project of creating a EU army. And we see here that uh, EU army is targeted as a clear expression of Brussels' desire of, for independence from the United States and NATO. Uh, it's labeled as a German maneuver to military control the continent after subjugating it economically and politically or financially. Uh, Emmanuel Macron is also considered a geostrategic poodle of uh, Germany. Uh, US would aim to encourage Eurosceptic, Eurosceptic uh, discourse and nationalist discourse as well in order to uh, divide and also make these cleavages useful to American interest. And also Donald Trump is associated, uh, this was very funny basically, uh, is associated with the ex-Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev uh, because he is said to, tri to trigger a perestroika in, the, in Europe. I, this was very absurd in my opinion, but actually in order to generate emotions, you have to use this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, structures. Last but not least, uh, we're trying to, I mean, Sputnik Romania Moldova tries to reproduce the Kremlin's alternative perception on NATO. Here also we have a twofold, uh, a twofold backlash. On one hand, uh, Sputnik tries to provide an alternative vision. And as I, as I mentioned before, this is an approach used in, in other states as well. Uh, for instance, related to the Romanian case study, uh, it is said that NATO is an outdated structure or a remnant of the Cold War. Uh, we see here that actually the Kremlin tries, uh, seems to uh, to live in an old paradigm, uh, while also uh, it is said that it will maintain a tense state of typical typical of that period to fulfill its role as, in, as an imperialist organization. On the other hand, uh, it tries to brand itself as a better alternative using, of course, uh, very specific narratives here, uh, while also instrumentalizing some sort of um, minorities, namely the Russian Lipova minority in Romania. Uh, for this reason, it is said that Russia has never started a war, but rather has responded to various aggression. This is a narrative which is commonly met internationally, not uh, strictly uh, applied to the Romanian case study. It tries to strengthen the Russian-Romanian relations at a level worth of historical tradition. And this is uh, the section, this is the narrative where uh, the little Russian Russian minorities in Romania actually play a crucial role. Uh, it is also said that an anti missile ship is needed just because NATO says so and because we don't need any uh, anti ballistic missile defense in Romania as a country which is labeled as uh, the eastern flank of NATO. And also uh, that NATO does not keep its promises uh, following the withdrawal from the INF. But lastly, uh, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned before, this is an interesting section because it covers a very specific case from Romania, which I will detail in the, in the following minutes. 
uh, and it is the last narrative approach used by the used by the Russian propaganda or the last form of let's say narrative approach affiliated to Kremlin's malign influence. Uh, it tries to shape Romanian attitudes using some sort of links, uh, of course, usually false links, between local organized crime and the presence of nature bases in Romania. Um, here, the most targeted case was the Caracal case. Now, uh, for the international audience, even though this case generated uh, international backlash uh, among the media mainstream, uh, the Caracal case represents uh, basically a situation, or a case where a 15-year-old girl named Alexandra Maceșanu uh, went missing and was actually found to be kidnapped, raped, and beat by a 16-year, 65-year-old car mechanic named uh, Gheorghe Dinka. Uh, the thing is that uh, the local authorities responded uh, very slow. I mean, 19 hours uh, late uh, after the after the event uh, has after the event happened, and for this reason, uh, the late authorities' response and in emo the emotional backlash of the case generated va uh, various protests uh, be uh, throughout the uh, Romanian public opinion. Also, uh, and for this reason, this was the, the context which basically uh, was f favorable for the Kremlin to conduct a very short or a very limited uh, propaganda campaign. Why? Because Caracal is located five miles away from the Veselo, uh, which is a common in uh, old country where a natural ballistic missile defense system is located. So, it was the perfect context in order to involve the narrative of uh, sex scandal of of the sex scandals in which the U.S. military troops are involved, uh, or the involvement of American soldiers in sex scandals with minors. Uh, also emphasizing that Romania is on the first place not only in the delivery of girls uh, for the human trafficking in the European Union, which is pretty damn true, uh, because those networks of uh, human trafficking are flourishing in Romania. Uh, and sometimes authorities usually prefer to close their eyes. Uh, but also in the trafficking of women for NATO military troops. Now, basically, this aspect, of course, is very uh, exaggerated. But uh, nevertheless, it has uh, it has also a, a true situation. But contrary, uh, there are also those like me and those like uh, and other experts which try to counter these narratives who are labeled as propagandists and manipulators by profession because actually they are trying to uh, reinterpret the information in order to link the Caracal case, uh, or in order to link, sorry, the uh, this narrative to the Russian propaganda and not with the uh, Caracal case and the presence of uh, US military troops uh, in the Veselo. So basically this has also a twofold, uh, a twofold approach. On one hand, they're trying to emphasize uh, the malign role that the U.S. military troops are playing in Romania, and on the other hand, they're trying to counter the counter-narratives of uh, fact-checkers and experts on countering malign influence in Romania. Basically, this was my uh, presentation. Looking forward to any more remarks, uh, questions, and any other curiosities related to, to the Romanian case study. And I will let uh, Antoni in the following to basically uh, moderate the following sections. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Razvan. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll have time for questions after all, uh, all the presentations. Yeah, no problem. Now I will turn to uh, Grigori, uh, who is now, I think, in the middle of the political turmoil in, in Slovakia. <laughs> because, actually, because there is something actually to do with, uh, with, with Russia and the, and the Sputnik vaccines. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much, Anton. Yes, it's true. Uh, let me first uh, to thank uh, you as editor of Kremlin's Influence Quarterly, but also Free Russia Foundation for inviting me to take part in this extremely interesting project. And I'm happy that I can have opportun uh, have opportunity to share my knowledge about uh, Russia's influence in Slovakia and to take part in this debate. And you're right, yes, uh, we are joking uh, here in Slovakia that uh, uh, the government uh, uh, imported uh, Russian vaccine to Slovakia to vaccinate people against COVID. 
the process of vaccination still didn't start, but uh, the Slovak politics is already vaccinated and the result is that government is collapsing. Of course, there are some spe specific ex aspects of the situation in Slovakia and it's a uh, result, I mean, this uh, collapsing uh, situation with the government is a result of the previous development and there were many factors which influenced the relation between political parties, some personal characteristic or characteristics of the politicians, but the fact is that in this final stage of the crisis uh, inside the ruling coalition was somehow provoked by, by uh, Russian vaccine Sputnik. But let me, let me start to introduce and shortly maybe characterize my uh, contribution. It's a contribution focused on the Russians, uh, Russia's influence in Slovakia, tools and actors. And I will speak, uh, I, will I will try to be as, as short as possible, uh, not to take uh, much time to my colleagues, especially for, uh, for the debate. But let me, let me start by one observation. I mean, how can, we, uh, how can we consider the Russian goals in Central Europe? So like Central European countries, which, have, uh, which has uh, many commonalities with uh, the neighbors, but also some peculiarities. And these peculiarities, I think they are creating uh, quite favorable conditions for and favorable environment for Russia's uh, penetration, Russia, I mean the state, so the current regime, current Russian regime, the penetration into, uh, into Slovakia's social and political fabric. But what is the ultimate goal of, of Russia today? I think, and at least I, uh, as I understand the situation, that uh, the ultimate goal of, strategic goal of uh, Russia's foreign policy in this region is to disconnect Central European states, the former satellites of the Soviet Union, which passed through very deep transformation process, became a part of uh, the integration groupings, European Union and NATO. And now Russia is trying to disconnect these countries from, from the West. Uh, so what is situation in Slovakia in this context? It's really uh, the fact that uh, Russia is providing, uh, imposing uh, its influence in Slovakia in order to uh, disconnect us uh, from the West, uh, taking us as a part of the Russia's engagement in the uh, battle with the West, or it's just, it's just a kind of... Uh, phantasmagoric interpretation, maybe it's an intentional invention, a bogeyman of small group of people uh, which is trying to uh, complicate or to destroy friendly relations between Slovakia and, and Russia. Uh, Slovak Information Service, which is a, a special uh, secret service, uh, published uh, uh, last year and one year before uh, a report. Its report, I think, in a special section, I guess it was uh, written by the counterintelligent uh, department of Slovak Information Service, inserted in, the, in this report uh, the paragraphs characterizing activities of the Russian state in Slovakia. And uh, you can find the very precise uh, description of Russia's activity in Slovakia not only uh, in the area of uh, espionage, but also in some domain, political domain, social domain, efforts to influence uh, decisions of uh, policy-making organs in Slovakia, also uh, uh, ma making uh, efforts to complicate relations between Slovakia and the West, uh, uh, conducting hostile propaganda, which is in, uh, in contradiction with the interests of our state. I'm also, I'm almost quoting our state and our allies in NATO and European Union. So if such a authoritative and prominent state organization as a Slovak information service uh, in its uh, everyday activities is uh, registering this kind of, uh, of steps conducted by the Russian state, I think the situation is really is really serious. I am not expert on uh, intelligence or counterintelligence. I am political scientist, so I'm dealing with the 
specific areas of activities of uh, Russia in Slovakia, which is uh, relevant for social and political development in Slovakia. So, and now I will try again shortly describe the factors and tools of Russia's uh, influence in Slovakia. I think that uh, uh, pro-Russian discourse, political and public discourse, which really it, it exists a long time, there are three main factors of persisting of this discourse. First is ideological legacy of the 20th century uh, intellectual elites, Slovak intellectual elites, especially prominent figures who are considered, who are uh, iconic person, who are really national leaders, which, for example, Ludovic Stur was a codifier of Slovak literary language. And this group of uh, Slovak intellectuals, it was in conditions of uh, Austro-Hungarian empire, which uh, when Slovakia wasn't a separate state, what wasn't a separate entity, they tried to define relations between uh, uh, Slovaks and other Slavonic nations, and especially the destiny, the future destiny of Slovaks as a national entity and Slovakia as a possibly independent state. And uh, at the end, they came to conclusion that it's only one way how to provide uh, favorable conditions for sustainability of Slovaks as a national entity. And they predicted, so even they, I would say, it was their recipe for, for Slovaks. It's a, a legacy and a message of Ludovic Stur, who is still, as I said, iconic person in Slovakia, that Slovaks should merge with the Russians. Slovak uh, will use uh, Russian language as a national language. So Slovakia or the territory which is populated by Slovaks will be part of the territory of Russia and Slovaks uh, will convert to uh, Orthodox Christianity. So the reality today is completely different. Slovaks are part of the Western community. It's a separate nation with its uh, uh, national characteristics, uh, separate language, uh, and with confessional, confessional peculiarity. Slovaks are still Catholics and, and Protestants. So it, but, but nevertheless, this ideological legacy, because uh, Ludovic Stur is considered as a de facto, the father of Slovak modern literary language, is uh, present uh, in everyday life. Uh, you can uh, find uh, uh, streets of uh, named on behalf of uh, Ludovic Stur, squares, different cultural institutions, museums, theaters, and so on. So it means that it's still present uh, uh, since uh, the half of, of 19th century. The second factor is ideological legacy of Slovak uh, uh, political el and cultural elite uh, in the first half uh, of uh, 20th century, but uh, left-leaning, left-leaning uh, cultural elite, which uh, de facto somehow emerged with the communist movement in Slovakia. Quite interesting and symptomatic thing is that ideological metamorphosis. While in 19th century, this pro-Russian sentiment was very typical for conservative or maybe even reactionary domain, in 20th century, uh, the main proponents of uh, pro-Russian influence in Slovakia, so people who somehow connected the destiny of Slovakia uh, and future of Slovakia, at that time it was part of uh, Czechoslovakia, with the Soviet Union, de facto with, it, with, uh, with the communism. And I think that why it's symptomatic? Because it, it tells us that uh, the perception of this two completely ideologically different groups of uh, intellectual leaders, they somehow, uh, they were thinking more about state. So it was an expression of sympathy and hope uh, with the uh, Russian state. And this Russian state uh, can or could provide, according to this perception, good conditions for, for the future of Slovaks. Today, uh, also we have, of course, uh, uh, very uh, diverse group of pro-Russian uh, actors in Slovakia, and it's a combination of everything. You can find here uh, communist uh, pe people with communist views, uh, nationalist uh, people with reactionary views, and I think it's also symptomatic because when we are trying to identify uh, their 
preferences in Russia, immediately we see that, I mean, the Russian state today, and the, if I can uh, call this ideological background of the current Russian political regime, it's really a combination of everything. And the Slovaks are trying to pick up something which uh, is closer to them. So it was about, uh, about uh, main factors which are feeding this uh, pro-Russian uh, sentiment and, and uh, pro-Russian discourse in Slovakia. Now, let me, uh, let me uh, just tell a few, few words about uh, this ethno, ethno-political element, this pan-Slavism. I mean, uh, uh, it's still also present in Slovakia, but quite interesting. Uh, this pan-Slavism in Slovakia means that it's a combination of not cultural, but political Rusofi uh, Rusophilia with a distrust to the West. And what is also quite unique that uh, this pan-Slavic rhetoric uh, is typical for, again, diverse uh, spectrum of uh, political actors, uh, Slovak National Party, for example, which is, uh, at least they present themselves as a, as a traditional national conservative movement, uh, then Smer Party, direct, uh, Direction Social Democracy, which is social democratic movement, uh, then uh, extreme right, fascist party of Marian Kotleba, all of them are using this uh, uh, pan-Slavic uh, uh, references, uh, despite the uh, differences, discrepancies between uh, the ideological discrepancies between them. What is also interesting that this pan-Slavic sentiment is focused predominantly on Russia, and not only this. So somehow proponents of this sentiment are either neglecting other uh, Slavic nations or they are criticizing them, these nations, that they are uh, not enough friendly and conciliatory to Russia. So, and Poles are criticized now currently Ukrainian, especially because Ukrainians are now in the conflict, conflict with, uh, with Russia. Uh, and maybe uh, I have now one minute here. Three main narratives of uh, Russian propaganda in Slovakia. The first is this, uh, narrative about uh, uh, Slavonic uh, Brotherhood, which is uh, which present, presents preference of ethno-cultural uh, and ling linguistic values over the universal, as far as the orientation of the country is concerned. So it means that according to this narrative, uh, democratic Slovakia or any kind of regime in Slovakia uh, has, um, uh, has to be closer to the Russia as a state, even if the regime is, in Russia is authoritarian. Then a narrative about uh, obsolete liberal democracy, which is not uh, proper for especially small uh, Central European uh, nations, including Slovaks. And the third narrative is that Slovakia as a small country is not enough secured and, and well protected in the alliance with so giant country as United States, uh, Great Britain, uh, France and, and Germany. So, and, and ab absolutely last last sentence, thank you, Anton, that you are giving me at least one, one minute more, that uh, uh, unlike, let's say, in, in Romania, or in some other countries in which uh, Russia is uh, imposing its uh, influence through the its, uh, channel in the uh, national languages, so Russian media outlets in national languages, in Slovakia, there is no any uh, Russian uh, media channel, either printed or online platform in, in national language. But who are uh, the proponents and actors of uh, uh, Russia's influence on the media scene? Plenty of uh, local outlets which are serving as the aggregators of uh, uh, content taking from the Russian media and spreading here in Slovak language by this quite committed group of uh, the influencer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grigori. And now let's turn to Maria. Uh, we were very happy to publish Maria's, well, essentially special, uh, special issue within our project on the Kremlin's influence quarterly. Unfortunately, it came uh, with a delay. Um, but now it's finally published. Maria, you're on mute. And we are really happy to, to have it, and we are really happy to uh, have you with us today. Please tell us more about your research. Um, thank you very much, Anton, and thank you very much, uh, Free Russia Foundation, for having me. It's always an honor and pleasure collaborating with you. Uh, just in a moment, I will start uh, sharing my uh, 
presentation with you. Hopefully. All right. There we go. Now everyone uh, should be working well. Uh, so in some ways, uh, for the sake of this presentation uh, today, we're moving a little bit along with the logic of inductive reasoning from um, specific observations and cases uh, described uh, by Anton, uh, Razvan, uh, Razvan and Grigori to a broader understanding of what it is uh, that unites political actors across Eastern Europe that find themselves, um, that prefer for some reason to cooperate with Russia. And this was essentially the question that motivated my uh, research from the start. Um, I do not subscribe to the concept that all of the uh, parties that embrace pro-Russian narratives in Eastern Europe are necessarily uh, Putin's agent deliberately, uh, because they all also have a lot of their domestic motivations usually, and try to in some ways at least respond to demands of specific social groups within those societies. So what sort of demands are they responding to? This is a question that uh, essentially motivated this research. And now, why specifically Eastern Europe, right? We know that uh, Kremlin's influence operations are active all over the world here in the United States, perhaps more than anywhere else. However, uh, Eastern Europe is interesting for several reasons. Uh, first of all, it commonly serves a testing ground for Russia's influence operations. We know that Kremlin tried uh, repeatedly some of the um, uh, disinformation attacks, some of the cyber attacks in Eastern European countries first, before spreading those to the rest uh, of the world and to the Western Europe. Uh, in addition, uh, Eastern Europe provides quite a prolific ground for uh, Kremlin manipulation and disinformation because of the painful sometimes history and legacies in the regions that in some way influence the regions present. Uh, therefore, Eastern Europe in some ways can be described as, to some extent, being more vulnerable to the Kremlin influence, although perhaps also more experienced, of course, uh, with it and perhaps better able to fight it in some ways. Now, for this presentation, I use the concept of reflexive control. Uh, it's the strategy uh, that the Kremlin uses in order to be able to shape its targets' um, perception and worldview in the way that is more advantageous uh, to Russia's objectives. Um, this is an approach that has been described by uh, multiple scholars, including uh, Timothy Thomas uh, in his uh, kind of foundational work back in 2004. In my own research, I described it uh, in recent years as well. So reflexive control consists of two main elements. The first one is reflex. That's essentially the tool uh, that the Kremlin uses. The process of imitating the target's reasoning or possible behavior and causing the target to make decisions unfavorable to uh, him or herself. Uh, and uh, the reflexive control also relies on the target filter. Filter is the target set of concepts, knowledge, ideas, and experiences, all kind of sort of essentially um, additional layers that influence our perceptions. Uh, the Kremlin, based on its old uh, Soviet toolkit that was actually pioneered by Soviet um, military thinkers back in 1960s first, uh, actually shapes, um, uh, influences uh, this filter of the opponent using different uh, reflex approaches in order to shape uh, the target's perceptions in a way that are uh, beneficial for the Kremlin. Specifically, with an application to Eastern Europe, in this presentation, uh, I argue that Eastern European filter includes all sort of kind of long-term legacies, history, cultural influences that condition and shape uh, the Eastern European countries' relationship uh, with the Kremlin and specific attitudes that are easy to manipulate uh, for the Kremlin propaganda. These include historic links to Russia, societal disillusionment with the Europe, recent uh, Europeanization that in turn led to the rise of political actors uh, in the region, general feeling of the insecurity and perceived dependence on great powers that's also uh, quite typical for some of the countries in the regions. All of those uh, kind of elements of the filter present prolific ground for the Kremlin to exploit. Uh, one of the particular elements, uh, one of the particular uh, results of the spreading um, kind of frustration with the European, uh, with the integration in the European Union and overall transition experiences in the region, uh, has contributed to the, right, the rise of Euroscepticism. And this, as I argue in my presentation, 
one of the key leverages essentially in uh, Eastern European filter that the Kremlin exploits. In this context, um, the Eastern European uh, reflects this uh, essential skepticism and growing frustration with experiences of Europeanization allows the Kremlin to manipulate it and deepen the divides between the East and the West by directly questioning the advantages of being a member of the EU, NATO, transatlantic community, trying to revitalize feelings of geopolitical in-betweenness and neutrality. And um, essentially, in this sense, you can see, argue that anti-European sentiment is used by the Kremlin as, as possibly as this reflects um, as a geopolitical uh, tool in order to deepen uh, the existing uh, divisions within the region. Uh, the question uh, therefore remains to what extent this argument actually is true, right? We need some evidence uh, to check the electorates of uh, these actors, supporters of these political parties with which uh, Kremlin collaborates in Eastern Europe to see to what extent that's actually the case. And this is what the rest of this presentation is about. In this research, I combine, uh, compiled the data set of um, Eastern European uh, parties that can uh, be uh, classified as um, uh, pro-Russian, quote-unquote, meaning that in their policies, agendas, rhetoric, uh, these parties in, embrace policies and uh, arguments that are indirectly or directly favorable to the Kremlin. And of course, some of the participants of today's panel, Glenn and Don Shavtsov, were very, very helpful in actually compiling this data set. I wanted to thank them uh, for the participation. Uh, so this is just a brief description of um, uh, classification uh, criteria on which a certain party was classified as being pro-Russian. The result led to uh, classifying 30 parties in 10 uh, Eastern European countries as, quote-unquote, pro-Russian. Uh, so here's a brief list of these parties. I don't think, unfortunately, we have a lot of time to discuss it more in detail, but I'm happy to provide you. Uh, there's a data set in uh, the report which is freely accessible uh, to everyone, and I'm happy to receive any kind of feedback. Now, uh, classification per se is great, but it's not enough to understand the sentiment that the electorates of these parties share. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, but some interesting findings from the data set. First of all, uh, there is a significant ideological heterogeneity. Uh, narratives that emerged in the recent years was uh, that the Kremlin primarily collaborates with the far right. Uh, we see that the findings from this data actually does not confirm uh, this argument. We see that there's actually collaboration with parties on both sides of the political spectrum, uh, right, con including conservative and radical right, but also left, including socialist center-left party families, uh, radical uh, left parties, as well as parties that do not uh, kind of classify themselves as belonging to any part of the political spectrum. Uh, second, uh, party strength is also oh, very significantly. We see that depending on the country, uh, the Kremlin uh, actually collaborates with very strong incumbent uh, parties as well as fairly marginal ones. So again, there doesn't seem to be any particular party. So uh, therefore, uh, we do not see clear uh, correlation between a party's ideology and uh, the Kremlin's kind of, and its more pro-Russian orientation. So the question then emerges if it's not ideology, then what is it uh, that pro-Russian parties have in common? The natural step, therefore, is to look at the electorates of these parties, supporters of these parties. Maybe they have some similarities that ex explain the embrace of pro-Russian agenda. And uh, um, essentially, I, in this research, came up with several hypotheses. The first one is Euroscepticism of these parties' electorates based on the logic outlined before. Uh, the second one was anti-establishment attitudes. It's possible to imagine that the Kremlin collaborates with the actors uh, that challenge the existing status quo in order to deepen existing divides in the country. The third one, education. So the assumption was that um, individuals who are less politically educated are more likely to buy into these narratives because they're not likely to check the facts. And the fourth one was age. Both older and younger respondents may be more likely to embrace pro-Russian narratives for two reasons. Older groups may be more nostalgic of the Soviet, of the communist times, uh, in which makes them more pro-Russian potentially. Younger social group, younger uh, respondents may be more uh, dissatisfied with the current economic prospects in the country, jobs, uh, therefore, uh, again, more likely to become pro-Russian. Uh, so here, essentially, I discuss the um, 
uh, how the data set was constructed. All of this information is available in the report. Uh, essentially, the data I relied on European Social Survey. Unfortunately, not all of the parties are available in the European Social Survey. So therefore, my data set has significantly reduced to only uh, 10 parties total. But nonetheless, it's still a significant enough data set to draw some interesting conclusions. And so uh, here are the results, uh, a testing of the four uh, different hypotheses about the commonality among pro Kremlin um, uh, electorates. Uh, so the pluses and minuses correspond to the respect, rel respective significance and sign of the coefficient. So if there is the if the um, certain cell is empty, that means that the coefficient, the coefficient was not significant. So I did not report it here. Uh, so I'm not going to be bothering you with methodological details here, but you can check in my uh, report that I tried different robustness checks. And so one consistent finding uh, that I find here is that is, uh, Euroscepticism is, uh, uh, comes out as comes across as the most consistent uh, characteristics that uh, the electorates of pro-Russian parties uh, share. So it's these groups uh, that are much more dissatisfied with the integration uh, with the EU and question in to some extent, it's uh, these parties that harbor uh, these groups that are more likely to embrace uh, this pro-Russian agenda. Uh, for other variables, really nothing else is significant. So to conclude, what does it tell us? Uh, I uh, argue in my report uh, that the Kremlin very aptly manipulates and exploits the existing frustration uh, with the European integration that spread over the region, uh, reinforced by the two consequences of the 2008 financial crisis, and uh, aptly used its uh, essentially manipulation techniques in order to deepen uh, the sentiment and foster uh, possible divides within uh, European uh, Union, within the past communist Europe, in order to essentially achieve its uh, political goals. Uh, therefore, we're likely to see that parties that embrace uh, directly or indirectly the pro-Russian agenda tend to have electorates who are disproportionately harbor Eurosceptic sentiments as opposed to uh, voters of other uh, mainstream parties. Um, some of the uh, positive uh, takes away uh, from this finding is that it seems uh, that the lack of the ideological uh, similarity across parties that uh, embrace pro-Russian uh, narratives is actually, to some extent, is a good news. Uh, the Kremlin's tools are limited. It, they're very opportunistic uh, in nature. And uh, uh, that suggests that the agendas of these actors and parties only temporarily align with Russian interests in a way that create opportunities for the Kremlin to exploit them. In the long term, as the European sentiment subdues, as the European Union actually figures out ways to perhaps accommodate or resolve some of the existing tensions, uh, we are likely uh, to see that there will be fewer opportunities presented for the Kremlin to cooperate uh, with these parties. Uh, and in other ways, as I conclude uh, in my report, these parties are fellow travelers of the Kremlin rather than uh, Trojan horses. And the final uh, consideration is that this finding is also published in the uh, party politics uh, on the academic article where I expand the data set to the rest of uh, Europe. So Western Europe is included. And the findings are actually the same. We see that Euroscepticism is one key theme for Russian actors have in common. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, thank you. And um, let me check whether we have questions. Um, I have a question to Razvan and, uh, and Grigori first, and then also for Maria. Um, Razvan and Grigori, could you please comment on... Um, so, obviously, there are um, resources, media resources that are directly connected to the Kremlin, uh, resources that uh, operate in Romania and Slovakia. What about, you know, um, so to say, authentically Romanian or Slovak resources uh, that could be identified as pro-Kremlin or pushing uh, the pro-Kremlin pro agenda, uh, are they connected to somehow to any Russian actors or are they trying to sell themselves uh, to the Kremlin, which actually uh, is very often the case that uh, we see some media resources and some, some websites that are pushing the pro-Kremlin agenda, but they're not paid by the Kremlin, they're not sp sponsored by Russian actors, but they're trying to sell themselves in the end. Yeah, you know, they, they want to show that they want to demonstrate that they are worthy of support, they are worthy of, of sponsorship. And uh, Maria, uh, for you, I have a question. Um, I was, you know, I was looking at the uh, governments in Austria 
uh, and in Italy, uh, they all collapsed now, uh, which included far-right uh, parties that are usually described as pro-Kremlin on their foreign policy. So in Austria, the Freedom Party of Austria, and then in Italy, uh, the, the, the League, Northern League by, of Matteo Salvini. I noticed a very interesting thing that essentially they uh, the reason why they failed to embrace the pro Kremlin agenda, you know, 100% is because they, at the same time, well, at least a couple of years ago, they were also very much pro Trump, uh, meaning they were also pro American. And when, for example, they would uh, travel to Moscow or when Sergei Lavrov would not demand, but probably suggest to them to say something against the U.S. and its influence in Europe, they would hesitate because, well, they like Donald Trump. Uh, representatives of both parties traveled to, to the U.S. to meet with, with Donald Trump, or at least with some people very, very close very close to him in your research and although I, I do understand that it was mostly you know uh, sociological research have you noticed any of this you know pro-trump feelings among the uh, among the pro-kremlin uh, parties in eastern europe or you know how does it play yeah so razvan and grigori let's start from you well, uh, to start with, uh, yes, of course, there are a few uh, authentic resources, but there are very few in number. Um, actually, what I know so far, apart from Anton knows what, 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 Anton knows what I'm talking about, people like uh, Karadja and uh, all those individuals, there are a few actors which are basically called uh, independent distributors in the literature, like NGOs and think tanks. For instance, where I study in the city of Cruz Napoca, there is actually a half dead think tank, which is, oh, rather NGO, not think tank, sorry, which is called Vastok, which in Russian means uh, East. Uh, basically, if I were to interpret strictly its name, I would say that uh, its orientation, its ideological orientation is pretty, uh, is pretty obvious. But if I were to look at its activities, uh, I would find out that uh, he it actually tries to sell itself to uh, to the Russian agenda if it was not if, or if it is not already sold since uh, since a few years. Uh, the reason why I'm talking this is uh, due to the fact that uh, in 2017 uh, it recruited teenagers for uh, the World Youth Festival from Sochi, and some of you might know about it. Uh, where uh, they have organized some sort of preparation committees in Romania. Uh, and have collaborated with um, other university centers like University of Bucharest, uh, as well as my community minorities like uh, the, Rus the Russian diplomat community from Romania, where they have sent teenagers along with representatives in order to represent Romania uh, in a sort of way uh, to, the to the World Youth Festival of Sochi. After that, uh, in, 20 in 2018, I think, uh, Another NGO was created, Future Team, uh, whose objective was to actually uh, send uh, independent uh, monitors, I think, uh, to the Russian elections. Of course, we, we, we are talking about uh, biased elections. So basically, yeah, there are some resources exploited in order to uh, promote the Russian or the Kremlin's agenda in Romania, but there are very few in number. Uh, and most of them are actually relevant. Uh, the, NG, the NGO I was talking about was mostly focusing on uh, organizing uh, the Russian Film Festival, and which that was pretty that was pretty much an activity which didn't imply that much uh, of a propaganda. But uh, in other times, uh, the thing is that uh, their activities were pretty limited. Their impact was pretty limited. This leads to the fact mostly that Romanians are, let's say, some sort of uh, suffer from some sort of social bipolarity. Yeah, we have ties with the East. We have, we are Orthodox. Uh, our language, even if it's late in that origins, uh, has a 20% Slavic component. Uh, we behave ourselves, but we, be, we behave ourselves in a Balkan way, uh, or at least this is the Western perception. Uh, but actually, Romanians are pretty much Western-oriented, and this is a very, uh, a very big challenge for the Russian propaganda to actually find 
uh, very strong narratives or very strong cleavages in order to be exploited and uh, succeed in its operation, in its wide influence operations. Thank you, Razvan. Uh, Grigori? Yes, thank you, Anton, for, for the question. I mean, speaking about uh, authentic Russian media outlets, so media outlets in Russian language or maybe Russian outlet uh, outlets in some foreign languages, I don't think they, that uh, but, uh, that spe specifically these outlets are really directly influencing Slovak public discourse. It's because uh, first, uh, the level of knowledge of Russian language is not very high, even among those uh, people who belong to the audience receptive to the contents coming from Russia. Not speaking about, let's say, English edition of Russia of Russia today. Uh, second, of course, oh, I mean, some uh, Russian TV channels are they are accessible in cable networks, but uh, in all monitoring, more in monitorings, uh, uh, I mean, the rating of these uh, Russian TV channels are deeply, deeply below, uh, I mean, of one person, even even lawyer. So it means that the main uh, proponents of Russian media contents are local outlets local Slovak outlets, and, the, and I think that really they are influencing public discourse, they are opi definitely opinion shaping, and they are relatively popular in some groups of the population. Just three examples. First is Hlavne uh, Spravy, uh, my news in translation, it's an online daily which presents itself as an alternative source of information and analysis, but uh, uh, at the same time, they are trying to present themselves as a mainstream media. Uh, what they are doing, they are collecting uh, uh, news uh, and commentaries from different uh, sources, including uh, Russian sources. They are very visible there. They are translating these sources into Slovak, and then they, they are publishing this as a mainstream media uh, production. So for many people, uh, sometimes it's not clear, and and the and the readers of of this of this online platform are, I would say, ordinary people. So not uh, very intellectual. So just people who wants to have some update about the situation, and uh, maybe mainstream media are too complicated for them, too analytical, and then they are consuming this kind of, of production. And this uh, main, uh, main news, so Hannes Pravi, I think they are really the main, uh, the main instrument, the main tool of Russian propaganda, but not in the Russian language, but in, in national language. The second, uh, second pro-Russian uh, media outlet, uh, also relatively, uh, relatively popular, it's a monthly. It's a monthly review, Zemavek, so it's uh, age and earth, which present itself as an intellectual uh, alternative review. It's uh, it's monthly, but it's de facto it's not monthly. I mean, they are not following chronologically what is happening. They are just uh, uh, producing uh, very specifically edited uh, content, and it's absolutely pro-Russian, even more than uh, this main news. So the editor in chief of this uh, monthly, so-called monthly, is a passionate proponent of uh, separatist rebellion in Donbass. Tibor Rostas, his name, and uh, several times he was an actor of uh, some cases with uh, with a criminal background. So he he was spreading uh, hate and uh, and he was even sentenced. He, he was in sentence conditionally, but uh, the guy is really very nationalistic, very xenophobic, uh, very pro-Russian, anti-Western, and uh, this media outlet is con is considered as a disinfo, as a disinfo and conspiratorial media. And the third example, of course, uh, is high, it's a broader variety of different platforms, but just, I mean, uh, to take them as an example, and the third, uh, the third uh, example is uh, internet radio station or radio platform, uh, free broadcaster. I think that free broadcaster is a combination of Hornes Pravi and and uh, Zemavek, so uh, H and Z, in the format of radio broadcasting. 
Uh, they are also quite popular uh, among the population. They are located in Banska Bystrica, not in Bratislava. Hlavne Spravy, my news, uh, located in, in Košice. So we see here geographic, uh, geographic coverage, very, very diverse. And um, according to my uh, estimate, uh, I mean, 15-20% uh, of the population together are following uh, this media. Again, they are quite committed, very energetic, very aggressive. Uh, they are delivering the content in the in very readable version, in understandable uh, version. And I think that if we are speaking about three main sectors of these pro-Russian influencers, influencers, politicians, then uh, non-party representatives, uh, civil society, uh, members, but very specific part of civil society and media. I think that these media are maybe the most influential because they have very uh, relatively broad audience. Uh, thank you, Grigori. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned this Zemavec uh, magazine because uh, several years ago I discovered a, a file, uh, an audio file that was leaked uh, by someone probably close to Zemavec, and uh, in this file there was an interview, uncensored interview of the editors of Zemavec with the Russian ambassador, uh, who would later go to, to represent uh, Russia in Finland. And in that particular, during that particular interview, the, the editors of Zemavec would even ask whether Russia would be interested in sponsoring a, uh, a pro-Russian party in Slovakia. So, they, they try to test waters. Uh. One addition, Anton, not only this, that uh, they ask, uh, asked the Russian ambassador, the former Russian ambassador, to, to help them uh, to get support for their media holding. But also, Russian ambassador organized the trip to Moscow. They met in Moscow with some people in academic community and even a magazine Međunarodne Žizni, which is, uh, I mean, it's mainstream, more or less, uh, it's quasi-academic, but I mean, not bad, it's not toxic, yeah, toxic uh, periodical. They organize meeting with them and presentation uh, of, uh, I mean, of these two guys, editor-in-chief uh, and uh, the editor, I mean, uh, owner of the, of, uh, of the publishing, uh, publishing house, and they presented them as a prominent representatives of Slovak public and media life. I mean, it was so comic. And for me, it was an indicator how deeply Russian, Russian periodicals, the serious Russian periodicals, how deeply they dropped in this, in this situation of uh, de facto isolation of this part of Russian intellectual community, that, I mean, uh, this uh, fringe marginal from the point of view of mainstream academia, people, I mean, they were uh, accepted and welcomed as a, as a representatives of, uh, I mean, the Slovak public and, and cultural and media life. Yeah, yeah, that was quite bizarre. Uh, Maria. Uh, thank you very much, Anton. Excellent question about, uh, you know, attitudes towards the U.S. among these Russian actors. And I think, if anything, your um, kind of a review of the current situation just shows how opportunistic those parties are, right? They technically should be embracing programming relatives, uh, narratives if they were to follow this overall kind of framework, right? And hence uh, being oriented not against just the EU, but also uh, the United States Transatlantic Alliance. But it, uh, again, it changes once they have the political actor who is actually similar uh, to their ideology and their views in the United States. So unfortunately, ESS did not have questions about attitudes uh, to the uh, United States of this party's electorate. So that's one possible extension, actually, of this uh, research using some other data, uh, possibly. Uh, but we do see definitely this opportunism uh, in their behavior, which further, I think it's a good news after all, in the sense that it limits the opportunities for the Kremlin. Uh, to exploit the sentiment. Again, repeatedly we see when the parties come to power, they actually are not as supportive of uh, the Kremlin and Russia's policies. Some of them voted, voted in support of sanctions on, the, on Russia after all, uh, despite saying otherwise, after some EU pressure. Uh, so from this perspective, uh, it actually just shows limits of the Kremlin's uh, manipulation of the mani ability to manipulate the existing divides uh, in Europe, I think. 
Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues, for this uh, very interesting discussion. It's great to have uh, such great minds in, uh, on one panel. And uh, I think I think we don't have any questions on our YouTube channel. So let me wish you all the best uh, for today, for the weekends uh, after Friday. Yeah, so thank you again and see you sometime later. Thank you very much, Anton. And thank you very much. All the best. Bye.